The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon or good morning to those of you who are joining me today for our hospice top claim errors session. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Krista Shipman. I'm part of the Outreach and Education Team with National Government Services, and I will be um, your hostess for our call today, our session today. Just a little bit of information before we jump into um, the top claim errors. Uh, I just have some background slides to go over and then just to talk a little bit about um, how our session is going to go today. Um, first, you see our disclaimer, which is basically saying that the information that we provide to you is accurate and up-to-date as of the time that it is being presented. And although we try to make sure that all of the information is accurate and up-to-date at the time that we present it to you, Medicare does have a way of changing. And so it is the re responsibility of every provider to remain up to date on all of the current guidelines and regulations which can be found on CMS's website. Um, the recording information here is just reminding you that uh, National Government Services does not permit any type of recording of our sessions, no digital or audio or any other type of recording. And it does apply to webinars such as the one um, that we are doing today. Um, and even though we don't allow recording of our sessions, I will let you know that the sessions that we do present as webinars, we make available on our YouTube channel. And I will talk about that a little bit further once we get into our resources. Um, but just know that there will be an availability to um, play back this session uh, once it's uh, posted to our YouTube channel. So our objectives for today are to look at the top reason codes that have been assigned to hospice claims within the past three months. We're going to look at a quarter's worth of information. We're looking at um, April, May, and June of this year. And so um, we're going to look at that and talk about what the reason code narratives actually show or what they'll say, like if you try to look them up um, in FIS-DDE or if you're um, in Connects and you're hovering over them uh, to look at the narrative that way. And then we'll talk about um, kind of how to interpret that, <laughs> what they mean when they're applied to your notice of election and your claims that you're submitting. So we're going to do this by first going kind of back to basics, looking at some billing reminders. Um, I think sometimes it's helpful to just remind ourselves of what like the basic tenets are of building and what we, um, billing, not building. Did I say building? <laughs> Sorry, I should not pay attention to the closed captioning because sometimes that just throws me off. Um, anyway, the billing basics, and then we'll look at the actual rejections and RTPs, or return to provider codes. I'll go over some resources for you, and then we will open up for questions. So I have this session scheduled for an hour. I'm probably not going to use all of that time. Obviously, I'm not going to use all the time to present because I do want to leave time for questions and answers, but um, it should only take me about a half an hour to go through the slides. So we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end, and um, depending on the type of questions you have about the information I'm going over, we may not need all of our time. So, um, you know, we may be done a little bit early. We may go our full amount of time. Just, you know, that remains to be seen, I guess. <laughs> so let's get into it and first go over some reminders about billing. So um, the first thing I want to talk about is the notice of election. So as we know, the purpose of that is to open an election period in the common working file based on the fact that the beneficiary has elected to receive hospice services under the Medicare program. And so having that election period open and out on the common working file will prevent inappropriate payment to non-hospice providers for services that are related to the patient's terminal diagnosis. And then once that NOE is processed, that common working file is going to maintain that beneficiary in a hospice election period until the election is terminated um, or if they revoke the benefit or when the patient dies. 
the NOE is considered timely filed if we, as the Medicare Administrative Contractor, receive it within five calendar days after the hospice admission date. So um, the receipt date on the NOE has to be within five calendar days after the hospice admission date. You will know that it's processed and um, completely well processed correctly through the system when it has a status location of PB9997, um, meaning that it hasn't returned for any corrections um, and it's not considered processed, again, until it's in that finalized status location. And um, another just reminder is that he Medicare is not going to cover and pay for the days of hospice care from the date of admission to the date the NOE is submitted and accepted um, by the MAC, that those days would be considered not non-covered and they are considered provider liable. So some things to keep in mind about the claim is that they can, we can only accept a claim and process it after the NOE has been processed. And again, is in that finalized status location. All of the services that are provided to the patient um, that are related to their terminal condition have to be submitted on the hospice claim. And hospice claims are billed monthly and sequentially. So again, meaning that that the claim for one month has to be submitted and processed before the claim for the following month can be submitted. And if they're not submitted in order, meaning they're not submitted sequentially, you will get a return on the claim because the prior claim is not in the system or is not processed yet. And there can be no gaps in days when you're billing for sequential claims. So, you know, since you're billing monthly, make sure that when, you know, you're billing the months that have a certain number of days, 30 days, 31 days, or February 28 days, that you're billing up through that date and that the following claim starts with the first day of the next month. Um, all claims have to be billed to Medicare, um, all hospice claims including claims for patients that are in a VBID MA plan and those who have Medicare as a secondary payer. Um, and the hospice claims are subject to the CMS timely filing guideline, which is one calendar year from um, the, the end date of the um, monthly claim. Okay, so we're going to be looking at rejections, those that are in status location RB9997 and those in TB9997, so return to provider claims. The rejected claims um, are typically claims that need to be resubmitted once they have rejected. There's only a certain number of situations or limited situations in which the rejected claim would have to be adjusted as opposed to resubmitted. And typically those are ones that um, they reject for MSP reasons or something like that. Those typically need to be adjusted, but most rejections have to be resubmitted. And then the, the RTP claims need to be corrected and resubmitted. So you don't have to like start from scratch and send a brand new claim, you can go into a claim that's been returned and then correct whatever error has caused it to return and send it back through the system. Um, and that'd be considered a readmission at their resubmission at that point. Okay, so the first type of um, reason codes that we're going to look at are the rejections. And again, these are the ones that have to be resubmitted in order to correct the reason why they were rejected by the claims processing system. So um, the top five rejections uh, for J6, um, and I'm going to say that there are, I think there are a couple that are just a little bit different um, with JK and J6, but just know that. All of the, the reason codes that we're looking at are somewhere in the top 10 for both regions, for both contracts. So we have U523A as the top reason code in J6 for with um, 2,224 claims 
38200 with 1827 claims, 39929 with 723 claims, 38032 with 312 claims, and U5600 with 196 claims. And then for JK, our top is 38030 38032 with 92 claims, 39929 with 63 claims, U5211 with 37, 38200 with 33, and U5600 with 27. So not as many as you can see. It looks a little bit different. Um, you know, JK is a little bit of a smaller region with less providers than J6. Um, but even so, you know, the top five uh, all have less than 100 claims that RTP'd um, from, um, what do I say, May, April, May, June. Yeah, the um, three months in that quarter. Okay, so let's look at the first one, which is U523A. And the reason code narrative that you would see if you look this up states that the dates of service are during both a hospice election period and a Medicare Advantage plans period that is in the VBED model. So um, this slide just talks about what the actual VBID model is. Um, and so like when a patient is in a Medicare Advantage plan, um, it talks about what um, original Medicare would be responsible for. Um, and then there's just a lot of information about this one. And then talking about if a patient um, is in the original Medicare program, um, they can in, they can choose to enroll in a VBID model participating plan. And so just know that I said at the beginning that when a patient is in a VBID plan, that all hospice claims have to be sent to Medicare. And that's just for um, like data purposes. And so you do need to send, you know, all all types of billing that pertain to hospice to both the participating um, like VBID MA plan and the original Medicare, um, which would be your MAC. Um, and that this U523A is actually an appropriate reason code to see when an original Medicare claim processes like the informational VBID claim. So basically all of that information just gives you background and details on like the VBID program and um, like all of the billing guidelines and the purpose of that. But the bottom line is that U523A is not something that necessarily needs to be corrected if you are submitting um, a claim for a patient within the VBID program. Okay, our next reason code 38200 is saying that you are overlapping a claim, your own claim. So something that's already been submitted by your agency. So the narrative is just saying it's an exact duplicate of a previously, <laughs> previously submitted claim and all of these fields um, are looked at to figure out, okay, is it the same beneficiary from the same provider for the same dates of service and the types of services that are provided? That's all that that's saying. It's just giving you all of the fields that it looks for to ensure that it's, it's matching what's already out there. So let's, just a little bit of background um, detail on this is that the claims processing system, um, and we refer to that as FIS, and that's the Fiscal Intermediary Standard System, although we're not considered an FI anymore. The, we're not changing the name of the claims processing system. It's still called FIS. Um, so it looks for um, any billing that's already out there, and there's only one billing that can be accepted for the statement period or for you know the monthly period that you're billing. And so this reason code is assigned when there's already a processed claim in the claims processing system in, in the history file. And so anything that has that same information is going to be sent back to you as a rejection. So just um, 
in order to correct this or to avoid it, just make sure that you are looking at history information either by checking your remittance advice or looking in NGS Connects or FIS DDE um, in order to look at claim history and figure out um, what's already billed before you send anything new to Medicare. Um, the next rejection, reason code 39929, is saying that each line of charges has been rejected or um, rejected and denied. And so the background here and how to correct it or at least how to look at it is that if there are different reason codes assigned to the line items on the claim, the claim itself is going to reject for this general 39929 reason code but in order to look at the level information, the line level information, you have to go into the claim and look at the claim page that has line details. Um, now in FIS DDE, you would go to MAP 171D from the um, claim, line, claim page that has the details. So I believe it's claim page two that you would either hit F2 or F11 two times in order to get to that MOP 171D if you're looking in um, FIS DDE. Or if you're in NGS Connects, you just go to, like looking at the line detail information, you just hover over the reason code that's assigned to the different line items to figure out exactly why the, um, the rejection um, was assigned. So again, 39929 is the claim level. It's just saying that we need to look at the line details and then the detailed information on the, um, each line item would give you whatever specific reason code was assigned to that line. The next rejection 38032 is saying that the claim is a duplicate of a previously processed claim. Um, so basically, this is kind of the same thing as that other um, reason code that was a duplicate reason code. It's it's the same situation. So it's just looking at different things. Um, it's just like a different um, uh, like claim reasoning that it goes through um, to get this reason code. Um, but it's the same thing. It's a duplicate. And so in order to um, to correct that, it's the same the same principle applies as the other one where um, you know you should be looking at your claim history information to make sure that you're not duplicating what's already out there and that only one claim for services or original claim can be um, processed in the claims processing system and so. If you have services that should have been on the original claim that were left off, you would need to adjust the claim, um, not submit a brand new claim with different information, even though it's for the same beneficiary and same provider. So um, if it truly is a duplicate, then you don't need to do anything if the claim that's um, already in the system was processed and paid. Um, but if it's not a duplicate and you're trying to add information, again, that would be an adjustment um, you wouldn't submit a new claim in order to get that information in the system. Our next rejection, U5211, is saying that the statement from a through date is greater than the date of death on the patient's file. Um, in just the little background that the claim through date cannot go beyond the date of death on the beneficiary's file. So you'll want to make sure that you look at the record in the common working file to determine the date of death that's on file there. And if it's correct, you would need to submit an adjustment to make sure that your through date or your to date and any line items on your claim do not go beyond the date of death that's on file. If the date of death is incorrect, then the Social Security Administration um, needs to correct that so that the common working file can be updated. Um, and once you have contacted the Social Security office, um, you can do this. Uh, the patient's family, of course, could do it as well. Um, but sometimes like if you have information like the, the death certificate or something that can prove the date of death, then Social Security will update it when a provider 
does request that. Um, so once that request has gone to the Social Security office, you just want to make sure that you monitor the patient's information on the common working file um, to, to make sure that the date of death is correct or has been corrected. And then once it's corrected, you can submit an adjustment to your claim. Um, and just a note, make sure that you're not adjusting your claim until that correct date of death is out on the patient's file. Uh, the next rejection reason code U5600 states that the dates of service are a duplicate to a claim with the same date of service that's previously processed. Therefore, no Medicare payment can be made. Um, so another duplicate, but this one um, has gone through, again, it's like a different way of looking at the information on the claim. And so typically the reason codes that have a letter in front of them are CWF edits. And then the ones that are all numbers typically are FIS edits. So um, same things that we kind of talked about already, you know, make sure that you are looking to find information that's already in claim history before submitting anything new. And if it is a duplicate, you don't need to do anything with it because um, the rejection is just going to stay out there. But the process claim is, you know, really what you're focusing on. Like that's the one that has like your correct information and your payment and everything. Um, if it's not a duplicate in the sense that you're trying to add information, then Again, submit an adjustment to the processed claim. So those were all the rejection reason codes. Now we're going to be looking at the return reason codes or the RTP reason codes. So the top five under J6, we have 37402 with 3,032 claims, U5106 with 1,343, U5181 with 439, U5194 with 140, and 17729 with 275. And in JK, the top is 37402 with 160, U5106 with one. 12, U5194 with 61. I think that's a new one. That one wasn't on J6, was it? Oh, yep, it was. It was just lower down. Sorry. <laughs> um, 7C625, that's the newer one, uh, with 41 and 17729 with 26. And again, all of these are somewhere in both top 10s. They just kind of fall differently um, for each contract, um, but they do seem to be ones that hit at some point. Um, with the uh, top tens. But again, we're just looking at the top five because that really encompasses like the greatest number of rejections and RTPs. So our first one, 37402, the reason code narrative, if you were to look it up, would say the hospice claim with a from date greater than April 1st of 1998. Goodness, I don't know why it needs to go that far back. <laughs> um, there's no claim with uh, type of bill 81X or 82X, whose through date is exactly one day less than this claims from date. So basically this is saying that the claims were not sequential. So the background uh, in uh, information on how to correct, this is something we kind of talked about at the very beginning when we were looking at the basics of billing, that hospice claims have to be submitted sequentially per calendar month billing. So we're not doing a 30-day billing period, we're doing a monthly billing period, and that the claim from the previous month has to be processed and finalized before the next month's claim is going to be able to process in the system. So the claims processing system looks at the claim history for a previous claim and make sure that there's no skipped dates. So as I was explaining earlier, if you have a date for um, June, there's 30 days in June. So your claim can't be June 1st to June 29th, and then your July claim start July 1st because there's a gap in days there. It has to be the full month of June before July can be billed. Um, and then just uh, the guideline that if the sequential billing requirements are not followed, the claim is going to return. Um, 
Also, if the prior claim is RTP'd, that claim has to be corrected and finalized before the subsequent claim can be submitted. So maybe you did submit the previous month's claim and just didn't notice that it hadn't processed completely before submitting the following month. So that's another good reason to check your history file to make sure that the information for that beneficiary um, is kind of all in order before submitting the next month's claim. So just looking at the previous month, make sure that's submitted and finalized. And again, a finalized location is a PB9997 status location. And then also just make sure that there's no gap in the dates that are billed. Okay, our next reason code is U5106. And that says that the hospice NOE um, that was received at a new election with a start date that falls within a previously established hospice election period. So, the um, just a little background that the NOE and the claims post to hospice elections and benefit periods to the common working file. So, if you are trying to submit for a notice of election, there can't be an NOE that overlaps something that's, um, that can't, it can't, your new NOE can't overlap an already established election period um, or benefit period that's in the common working file. So, just make sure that you're not duplicating something that's already been processed. Um, and this could be something that, like, you're submitting an NOE and hadn't realized that the NOE previously submitted had processed, and you might be overlapping something that you already submitted. So just before you submit anything new, you want to look at the information in the common working file, um, the benefit periods that are out there, and you can, you can check that in the IVR. You can use HETS or NGS Connects or whatever system you use to verify eligibility um, before you bill to make sure that the date on your NOE is not within a start date and term date of a benefit period that's in the common working file. Okay, this one is kind of a long one. This <laughs> reason code U5181. Um, it's saying that per the CMS claims processing manual, that an occurrence code 27 is on the claim for the billing period in which the certification or recertification was obtained. Therefore, like you have to follow these guidelines. So I'm not going to read them all. I'm going to leave these out here for you so you can read them. Um, but it's saying when it is appropriate or not appropriate to bill with an occurrence code 27. And I do have a job aid out on our website that talks about this as well. Um, but overall, in or it's kind of like in summation of the information that was on that previous slide, you would use an occurrence code 27 and the date of election on all NOEs and initial claims following a hospice election. Occurrence code 27 and the date are required on subsequent claims when the claim date of service overlaps the first date of the next benefit period. If the occurrence code 27 is required, but it's not reported or doesn't have the correct date, then you're going to see this reason code. So you just want to make sure that the occurrence code 27 is submitted on the NOE and the occurrence code 27 date has to match the from date and the admit date on the NOE. So that's kind of like summarizing all of those guidelines that are part of the reason code narrative. All right, RTP reason code U5194 says that a hospice NOE with an admission date has to be received within five calendar days after the effective date of the hospice election. Um, an initial hospice claim where the from date does um, do, date matches the admit date has been received and the NOE was not received timely and the occurrence code current span code 77 is either missing or contains invalid dates. So this kind of goes back to what we reviewed at the very beginning where we were saying that um, if the NOE is not submitted timely, that the dates um, between the admit date and when the NOE is um, considered received are considered provider liable. And that's what the occurrence span code 77 is. So, um, 
just to reiterate that background that the NOE has to be received within five calendar days after the effective date. If it's not received timely, Medicare is not going to pay for the days um, that the patient was cared for until the date of the NOE when it was submitted and accepted and that those are considered provider liable days and have to be reported with the current span code 77. So the span of dates um, has to be um, reported with that occurrence span code. And then any services um, in those related charges that are that were done within those non-covered days need to be reported as non-covered on the claim. And then the note on this slide is just a reminder of how to calculate the due date of the NOE or like the final drop date of when it would be considered um, timely. Um, received, filed and received. Our next RTP reason code 7C625 um, is just saying that the reason for discharge needs to be clarified. And um, it's giving all of these different reasons why the claim would be returned. So um, I don't have a slide that has like how to correct or adjust because all of the information that you need to know in order to correct this reason code is within the reason code narrative. So you just have to figure out what the circumstance is, um, like why you would be, like why the discharge is being submitted, and then to make sure that the appropriate coding and remarks are on the claim. So this is a pretty comprehensive reason code. So that's why I didn't really have like a correction or how to avoid because it, it spells it all out in the reason code narrative. It's a pretty long narrative, but um, it gives you all the details there. All right, our next RTP reason code probably looks familiar to you if you've run across this because there was a little bit of a glitch with this um, applying appropriately when it was first implemented. And that's RTP reason code 17729. And it's saying that the attending physician NPI um, that was compared to PECOS um, does, is not, was not found. Basically that the um, physician that was reported was not um, in the PECOS file is ordering referring for hospice. Um, so as a reminder for how this reason code was a, is supposed to apply, and it does now, is that for claims that are submitted June 3rd through October 6th, the um, hospice attending and certifying physicians, if both are reported on the claim, are going to be subjected to the ordering and referring edits. And so the name and the MPI of the certifying or the recertifying physician need to be reported in that ATT, PHYS, or the attending physician field. And so FIS is going to look at that field and compare the name and the MPI in that field to what's in PECOS. Um, and you can verify the status of that MPI by looking at CMS's ordering and referring data set. Um, as I said, there was um, a little bit of a glitch in the way that kind of like the background processing was happening when these claims were first being submitted. Um, and it had to do with something about the file in FIS and the file in PECOS. Like they were looking at the wrong file, not the wrong one, but like the the information from a different data file. And so now it's pulling from the correct file. And so this edit is now um, being applied correctly. Um, so the only thing I can say about this one is if you have claims that may have hit this reason code in error, um, you could just resubmit them now um, in order for them to process correctly through the system. So this just gives you uh, more detailed information on like how the system is looking at this. So it's assigned when um, all of these bullet points um, are met or how, how the, this is applied. 
And instead of looking at all of this um, and reading all of this to you, I'm going to leave this up here for a couple minutes. But I'm also going to let you know that there is an article on our website that details this. Um, so you can go out to our website and look at that information as well. Um, and the information from these slides or the actual slide deck is available on our website. And I'll talk about that um, in just a minute. So while I am going through the resources, I want to give you an opportunity to ask any questions that you have about the slide um, details that we covered today. So if you have any questions about some of the reason codes that I covered, I would be happy to answer those for you. Um, I cannot look at specific claims and we have to make sure that our questions are HIPAA compliant. So just make sure that when you are asking your question that you um, don't include any claim specific or beneficiary specific information. Um, so you should see the question box now. Um, you can type in your question, question and click send. If you are more comfortable asking your question verbally though, I will give you the option to raise your hand as well. Um, so if you want to, you can um, click on that little hand, it'll raise your hand and I'll know that uh, you want me to open your line for questions, uh, for your question. So give me just a second. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to talk, why is it my, my screen is not moving. I keep trying to move it, go. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is our website. And I've already mentioned a couple times that um, we have information out on our website for you. So I just want to show you um, where you can find the information that I'm showing you on this slide. So if you go to our website and, um, let's just go from the very beginning for those of you that may not be familiar. Um, you go under the IMA home health and hospice provider and you can select your state. I'm just going to click the first one that pops up. And then that takes you to the home page for home health and hospice. Um, and you can see, you know, all of the information that we have on our home page. Uh, lots of like quick links there. But what I want to point you to is our education, Medicare topics, hospice billing. And you can see a lot of the information that we have out here in our um, for article form and uh, job aid form. And the couple of things that I was talking about earlier, the hospice claim reporting requirements for attending and certifying physicians, like this like spells out what that guideline is based on like the dates of service and when things are going to be implemented. And then there's also a link to the article on reason code 17729. Um, so what I had on that slide, you can find here on, um, on the article that has to do with that. And then of course, there's lots of other articles out here, lots of great information out here, lots of billing guidelines um, for you to look at. Um, if you want to look at that, the other show is under related appeals. If you go to top claim errors, that's where you look up like different um, reason codes and see if we have them out there as a top claim error. And we update this quarterly. So, um, you know, so a lot of the ones that we talked about today are out here. And um, you can do the view details and it gives you more information about the error. So, um, so lots of great resources out on our website. Um, CMS's website has the benefit policy manual and claims processing manual, each with their own chapters on hospice claims. I would familiar yourself familiarize yourself with those. Um, there's also the Medicare Learning Network and the specific page for hospice providers, which is the hospice center. Um, something you may have seen if you were here early enough to see our rolling slides before the webinar started is um, information about our podcast. And if you were not aware that we had a podcast, I would recommend that you check it out on either Spotify or Apple. 
we have new episodes on the second and fourth Thursday of each month. And so um, we're taking a little break for the summer, but there are lots of episodes already out there for you to listen to. So if you're new, you can catch up <laughs> um, until we start dropping new episodes. Um, our social media, uh, YouTube, we have Medicare Mobile where you can get news updates um, or play games. And you would either text news to 37702 or games to 37702. We are also on LinkedIn. Um, Medicare University, if you're familiar with that, um, that is our self-paced learning platform. And that is getting a facelift and that should be launched um, I think in the next couple of days, I think at the beginning of August was our was our due date for having Medicare University, um, the new look completed. Um, and then our YouTube channel. So what I was talking about before about the um, webinars that we do every month, we make available on our YouTube channel. So you would just uh, go out to our YouTube channel and you look for the... I, I think it's the educational playlist. Let me bring this back over here so I can show you. So if you go to our apps and then you do view all apps, um, you'll see there's one for our podcast, but then there's also one for YouTube. And once you get out there, um, you go to playlists. And under the playlists, you will find the home health and hospice on-demand videos. And that's where we house all of the videos that we have done um, like in the previous month. So this webinar should be available within the next week for um, playback. So just to give you an idea where that information is out on our YouTube channel. Um, and then I showed you our website. We talked about NGS Connects, which is a free portal um, for our providers. So if you have not heard of NGS Connects by now, or if you are not um, a user in NGS Connects, I would highly recommend that you sign up um, to, um, to use our portal. Because uh, I said it's developed just for our providers and has lots of great features. Um, and then, of course, sign up for our email updates, and you can do that on our website as well. Uh, one last thing um, before I get to your questions is um, our summit. If you have not heard about the collaborative summit that we do every year, we work with the other home health and hospice max for the um, states that are not within our jurisdictions to put on a three-day educational summit. This year, it's in Las Vegas, Nevada. It is at the Flamingo. And um, so we work with CGS and Palmetto GBA and all of the internal departments there work with our internal departments, meaning we have provider enrollment and appeals in the medical review and audit reimbursement along with um, you know our area the provider outreach and education and we also have CMS doing um, a session the UPIC is going to be there the Department of Justice so lots of great opportunities for education so um, it's so cheap, too, and it's so cheap for three days of education. So I would highly recommend um, you signing up to join us in Las Vegas, Nevada this year. Okay, so with that, let me see what questions you have for me in our question box. Okay, so Siobhan, I think um, what your question you're asking, is there a site where we can put in a reason code and it would return what the description is along with how to resolve it? Um, that, if you do not see a reason code in our top reason code section of the website where I showed you, um, you can always... Um, request that that be added, especially if it's one that's giving you a hard time. <laughs> um, it might be helpful for other providers to see, but the top errors section does have, um, I, I believe we do the top 15 
Um, basically, anything that has over 100 claims that are hitting that reason code, we will put out on our website. So if you're, if you're not finding one out there, um, let us know and um, we can look into getting it added. Um, next question, is there hospice targeted webinar for part B? Um, what type of, what type of um, subjects are you looking for, Samantha? Because we, um, like our team is the home health and hospice team. So we focus on um, billing and this session looking at correcting billing errors for home for hospice providers so what topics are you thinking of that might be like a good um, subject for us to cover um, Karen your question does does Social Security need a copy of the death certificate in order to update the date of death I just gave that as an example I'm not really sure what Social Security asks for in order to update the um, date of death on file. I, I don't know what they're going to accept. Um, so you would need to contact them in order to figure out what type of documentation they would need. That's that's the only thing that I could think of that like, off the top of my head um, that would be like something that they would accept um, for, um, for updating that file. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, where can we find these slides on your site? That is another great question. Let me go back to our website and I will show you exactly where you can find that. So when you are on our website, um, if you go to, you don't have to go from the homepage, you can go from anywhere. All of these um, are kind of static um, topics. So if you go to events, and you look at today's event, so the hospice top claim errors is out there, it's this PDF file. That's where you can find the slide deck for the session today. And once we're finished with the session, I don't know how long it takes, um, like after the end of the session, this will actually get moved to past events. So you can see, um, like yesterday, I did the hospice top, or the home health top claim errors, and that is now in past events since it's not a current event. So but right now it's out in current events, but if you are looking for them tomorrow, it's going to be in the past events. Oh, it might help if I actually, uh, I paused my screen. I am so sorry about that. You're probably just like, what are you talking about? <laughs> here, let's do that again. So if you go to the events page um, right here, you can see hospice top claim errors and um, the PDF is there. And what I was showing you is that past events um, you can see like the ones that were done even earlier today. Once the the session is over, it automatically gets moved to the past events. So you can see like yesterday I did the home health errors. That's out there. Um, my coworker Erin was doing a lunch and learn on hospice transfers. And so the slides that she went through are out there now. Um, so yeah. So right now they're at the current events, but they will be moved to past events. <laughs> Sorry about that. I forgot that my screen wasn't moving along with me. Okay. Okay. Um, so the question, another question from Tanya, when a patient revokes, must the D9 and remarks be entered um, why the patient revoked? Um, let's see. Let's go back to... I think that was that one reason code that was talking about the revocations. Because depending on the situation, you need different coding. Okay. See, I thought the D9 was an adjustment reason code. I'm not... Um, completely versed on um, all the different um, 
coding like off the top of my head. So I'm not really sure what the D9 is, but in general, I can tell you that when a patient revokes, you do need remarks. And that's what this reason code was talking about. Okay. All right. So the suggestions, um, uh, part B, professional claims. Um, okay. Modifier appropriateness. These are all good suggestions that I can send to our part B PO team. So um, those are all good suggestions that I can um, send to our part B team. So thank you for that. Okay, I don't see any other questions in the question box. I don't see any hands raised. Um, so I am going to let you go a little bit early, but thank you so much for joining me today. Please, when you receive an email after this session asking for um, your feedback on a survey, uh, please take a couple moments to complete that. That it really helps me to know like how I'm doing um, with the webinars and how we are doing in general um, with our educational um, approach and offerings. And so thank you so much for that. And thank you for um, both of you for your suggestions for part B. Um, as I said, I will take that to our part B PO team. Um, so yeah. Uh, this was great. Great questions. I appreciate your time and um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much. And um, we'll talk hopefully in our next session. Bye everyone. <laughs>